Dio. Bishop Allen, thank you so much for being here. And we got a lot to talk about. Welcome, my friend. Brother, I'm telling you, it's been too long. So excited to connect with you and to talk about the issues that we're going to be addressing here today. So pivotal for the body of Christ. Thank you. You know, I'm so, um, I, I really impressed by the way that God has, has given you a voice to interview so many people so artfully, so tactfully, and you draw oh, the, you. just the best out of people in interviews. And so everybody who's watching, if you haven't seen Alan really begin to do his interviews and encounter today, you really got to go check it out. And uh, there's actually a new book he has coming out that I want to talk about in just a little bit today, because I got to tell you, um, I saw some things, he showed me the trailer. It's like the preview to the movie. And we We'll get into that in just a little bit too, but I got to tell you, you don't want to miss that. I, I actually had a little bit of the goosebumps, so I was like, man, this feels like an action film, but it's reality, so mm. I'm looking forward to that. But Alan, one of the things I want to get into today, just for everybody's benefit, um, because if people follow you on TikTok or they follow your different platforms, they'll learn so much about the end times. And it's one of the reasons I really so gravitated towards you is because mm. you have such an ability to take really complex issues and bring them into bite sizes and really understandable. And one of the issues I want to get into today with you, if you don't mind, is I'd like to talk about the pre-trib rapture. I'd like to talk about eschatology just a little and get into why we believe in a pre-tribulation narrative. And uh, I just kind of want to give you the floor for a second. And can you kind of help us understand that? Because it's so controversial today. People are talking about it. You got people arguing left, right. And I like kind of the point of view that I read the Bible and I see the way you see it pre-trib. Can you help us yeah. today? Yeah. And I think it's very important that we pay attention to the doctrines that are maligned, that are attacked, that are taken advantage of, Come because on. it's there where the Lord is moving. When you see the enemy attack a certain front, wow. we need to know that he's scared of that revelation. And particularly when we look at the Bible and we see one out of every four verses in the Bible is a prophecy. Eschatology is very prominently featured throughout the entire Bible, particularly in the New Testament. We see it's a subject that believers need to get into. I was just in Greece, as a matter of fact, in Thessaloniki, that, which speaks to the, the epistle of Thessalonians. And Paul was only with them for a few months to establish that church. And what was wow. his focus when he was there for a few weeks, excuse me, was eschatology. Right. Night and day, he was talking eschatology with them. So this is a really, really, really important subject that we need to get into. And I want every single person watching to let us know what you think in the comments. We need Please. to not be afraid of the debate, yep. of the differences. We don't disconnect or disassociate with no. people because they differ on these issues. But it's so important because, uh, Brother Joseph, I believe that a proper understanding of eschatology protects us from end time deception come on that when the apostle paul lays out the armor of god in ephesians chapter six and maybe we can dive into this in a little more detail here maybe in a moment so. yeah but he talks about the helmet of salvation yep. if we have time we'll talk about this but the helmet of salvation speaks of the blessed hope of the coming salvation of our lord jesus christ to save us from the wrath that is to come, Woo, come and we on. need that helmet today now more than ever we do. Well, that's powerful right there in itself because it saves us from the wrath which is to come. And we're not appointed unto wrath. That's that's mm -hmm. one of the things people overlook and they say, well, the church is going into the great tribulation. There's things happening. The Antichrist will be revealed and we're going to have to endure this. You know, I just don't read scripture that way. I believe that we are, we are the ecclesia and the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Uh, your thoughts, Ellen, on that in regards to like the Antichrist? Yeah, I was... Interestingly enough, recently I was asked by someone, does it seem like post-tribbers are just really angry? Just <laughs> just post and and it, not not that all are. No. But if you pay attention to the discussion, there's this vitriolic reaction, mm -hmm. not against mid, not against post, not against pre-wrath, but all of the vitriolic reaction comes against pre-trib. Why is it almost like this knee-jerk hatred right. to the pre-tribulational position instead of just we differ? I think there's a spirit behind that that's and so strong. to speak to your question i think i think it's really important that people recognize that when we're talking about the helmet of salvation and the hope of salvation from the wrath to come you'll hear this objection all the time well every christian has had to endure tribulation who are you to think you westernized soft lazy invertebrate <laughs> western christian yep. you think that you're going to escape tribulation that's not the position no, no one teaches that. No, not no at all. No one in the pre-tribulational position teaches. So if you're if you hold to that, if you believe that, someone's lied to you somewhere. That's You've right. Bought into propaganda. Here's the pre-tribulational position. It is this: 
you are going to endure tribulation. It is going to get really, really bad. And you're going to have to cling to the hope that Jesus could come at any moment to rescue out you out of this, the doldrums of this life. But we all believe we're going to go through tribulation. The tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, speaks of the wrath of Almighty God. Now, we're wow. talking about a time that Jesus said is unlike any time that has ever come on the face of the earth or any time after it. So it's not it's not every Christian has had to endure this. Who are you think? To, no, no Christian has had to endure this, as a no. matter of fact. No one has had to face no the one. wrath of God like this. Oh, so man. who are you to think that you're superior to every Christian who's ever come? They've escaped it. Why wouldn't you escape it too? That's my position. Boy, that's strong, Alan. You know, I really appreciate you bringing up the escapism mentality because that's what people talk about with it. And yet you see people that believe this position. And again, we're okay differing. It's not like we're going to yeah. attack people for believing different because the Bible does point at things. And that's why we just, you differ. But the bottom line is this is how I see the Bible. This is how you see the Bible. And it's interesting. Some of the people who believe this position the most really say, well, if I believed in escapism, why would I be doing the work? It doesn't make me lazy. I'm doing more. I'm after it. I think of our friend uh, Rick Renner, who's over in Moscow. And he's like, well, look at my life. You know, I'm over mm -hmm. here changing, you know, basically, and I'm speaking for him, but it's like he's changing a nation. And yeah. he's not shrinking back saying, oh, Lord, get me out of here. It makes you more empowered. I like your points, though, Alan, when you're talking about this. So one of the points I want, would like to get your comments on is the Antichrist stands up like in Revelation 13. He stands up and begins to bring all this, you know, ability to bring, make war on the saints. He's able to overcome the saints. But I believe, and maybe you can give a comment on this, that there might be a difference between those saints and the church. Can you help us with that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, what you're speaking of in Revelation 13 is in direct contradiction to Matthew chapter 16, where Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So you have this entity that is birthed in the earth that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. And yet when you get to Revelation 13, we see something that the Antichrist is given power to prevail against. It's a seeming contradiction until you read through the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation quotes from what we can see, it's probably much more than this, the other Old Testament more than 500 times, if I'm not wow. mistaken. Amazing. That's the reason why it's the last book. You need, to, you need the context of Genesis through Jude in order to understand the book of Revelation. But when we're reading through it, the first three chapters mention the ecclesia 19 times, the church. When we get to chapter 4, door is open, John goes up into heaven, and all of a sudden in chapter 6, the great tribulation has begun and the wrath of God is being poured out. We don't see the church mentioned not one more time during this period. In fact, there is not one verse in the entirety of the Bible that places the ecclesia in the great tribulation. Not one verse in the entirety of the Bible. So we have the wow. church mentioned 19 times in three chapters. Then we get to chapter 4 and go in into the great tribulation we don't see it mentioned again. Amazing. That's because the church is gone. It is, it is, it is in Second Thessalonians chapter number two, this restraining force in the earth. The Bible says, He who now letteth will let until he's taken out of the way. In Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses seven through eight, there is he there is there is this there's res restrainer. And when he's removed, all of a sudden the Antichrist can be revealed. What is it that's holding back the Antichrist? Now, there's people who say that's the church. There's people who say that's the Holy Spirit. There's people who say weird things like it's Michael or it's Michael. Rome. Yeah. We, we'll not go into those. The no. most prominent <laughs> ones are, is it the church or is it the Holy Spirit? Yep. Well, it's, it's actually both. It Come is on. the Spirit-filled church. Yep. I think we have downplayed the unique privilege we have as believers. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. This yes, is a unique are. dispensation we're living in where the Spirit of God is not is not separate from man, but living within men on this earth. And we are holding back the darkness. We are pushing back against the Antichrist. So the Antichrist and his kingdom cannot come because we would cast him out come on. if he would. We would that's come it. against him full force. And that's the reason why it doesn't make sense when you see the saints mentioned, in fact, Revelation 13 is quoting Daniel, the saints that Daniel is talking about. Saints is a generic term that is used for the people of God in a lot of different time periods, from yep. the Old Testament 
all the way through the news. So people need to make that distinction. Oh, Alan, that is great. I hope everybody's getting as blessed as I am. I, I encourage you repost this, share this right now, because we're just getting started. And uh, I'm going to ask Alan just a couple of questions with this, because he's, um, you know, I don't know if you're as blessed as I am, but I enjoy listening to you monologue on these things, Alan, because it oh, really <laughs> helps people uh, put put a grasp on this. Um, one of the questions that I get a lot, you know, and I'm going to let you kind of handle it, but is the whole conversation of the last Trump sound, you know, the last mm. trumpet, the seventh trumpet. That means obviously Jesus is coming back either mid-trib or post-trib and all that stuff. Can you help us with that? Because because you hear this conversation and you're a very good apologist for these things, Alan. And so if you would, please, can you, can you help us with that conversation just a little? Well, thank you. And the reason is, is because when I was first born again, I had a, I had a dream and I can count on one hand how many prophetic dreams I've had in a quarter of a century. And I had a dream where I was taken up into the clouds and everyone was being left behind. And there was wow. a, there was a clock up in the clouds and it was 1159 and it was about to strike midnight. And when it hit midnight, I came up off of the ground and people who I thought would go with me were left behind. Mm. And I awoke suddenly with these words on my li lips, Jesus is coming. Wow. And I, I, I developed a passion for this subject and begin to dig into it to answer all these questions. And one of the most prominent ones is what about the last Trump? And what people don't realize is that in the Jewish community, there's trumpets for everything. And so in many feasts and in many occasions, there's a last Trump. You just have to know which one is specifically referring to. Now, the revelation of the rapture of the church was given to the apostle Paul when he lays out that in first Thessalonians chapter four, when he says the last Trump, yeah. This is decades before the book of the Revelation is written. Come on. John received a unique revelation from Jesus while he was on the island of Patmos around 90 to 95 AD. He Powerful. receives this never before seen, never before received revelation and talks about the uh, seven trumpets, the seven bowls, uh, you know, all, all of those, all of those things never before been heard of or seen. Yep. The apostle Paul wrote about the last Trump decades before that. So he could not have been referring to what John was talking about in Revelation. Come That's on. not a good way to interpret scripture. He can't be referring to that. It hasn't been written yet. He's referring to something else. Now, yep. some people think it's referring to the um, Rosh Hashanah and the last trumpet during there, which seems to be appropriate to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah. there are many other theories along those lines, but it can't be referring to uh, John's revelation of the seven right. trumpets there. Right. Alan, I think that's so well put. And I think if you're honest and you begin to look at things historically on a timeline, you put it together and you start to see different segments. So I just appreciate you doing that. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm remembering a vision I had about you recently. Now, this is a weird thing to jump into. Mm. Uh, and so I'm in this moment and I just, I believe the Lord is unlocking things for you. Um, in a, a capacity where ancient archives are. I saw you in an ancient archive room and you were behind um, a place nobody could get to. And the Lord had taken you there. And I just had this like within the last four days and it just came to me as we're here. And I, I, I actually was like calling to you and I could hear you in the ancient, like in an archive room, way in the depths of like an ancient castle really. And, and you were doing this. And as you're talking right now, I'm reminded of this, Alan, that I believe that you're going to do more and more of this where you bring people out into a place of understanding and like a Josiah anointing, unlock mm. some of the archives that the Lord has, has had kind of, you know, there all along, but people haven't known how to get them out. And I believe you're going to get people out or you're going to get the information out and give it to the people once again. Here's the word of the Lord I sense for you. And I'm, I'm going to get back into the interview, but I sense something wow. strong here. I sense the Lord saying over your life that when the scriptures or the archives are read, the people will weep when they heard mm. the law, when they hear the law, when they hear it again, almost as if it's for the first time. And so even as you're breaking this down, I sense this and I sense this, um, this ability to open up the eyes and the ears of people or generations that have left things like just in a place of archive and they can't get to it. But that's what I see happening with you. But my goodness, thank you for indulging me for a moment. I just really sense that about you. Wow. And it's, uh, that's, that speaks, can I say that that's confirmation. First of all, the Bible speaks of a special crown for all those who love his appearing. And it's, it's our heart and our passion to get people to fall in love with the return of Jesus again. Come on, Alan. To fall and not be scared of it, not be anxious about it, not sensationalize it, but fall in love with the return of Jesus. And we've been having internal discussions here that you couldn't know about, about digging into the archives, digging wow. into history, 
wow. and discovering um, the prophecies that have been made and the teachings that have been done concerning the end times that have been forgotten for a long, long time, uh, even potentially doing a documentary along the line. So, oh man, that speaks tremendously to us. And thank Praise you, God. Oh, my thank honor, my friend, that. my honor. Well, I, I get really excited about it. You know, it's interesting whenever you and I come together and I start talking with you, I feel this, this anointing, this synergy, this strength to, to take ground, to, to create life for people uh, with revelatory understanding. So thank you for mm clarifying that that was on, but I, I just got to say, I'm, I'm thrilled about this. So when we're talking about the things we're talking about and people looking at the end times, I think it's Peter, the book of Peter that says that we are to eagerly, or we are to hasten the return of the Lord through our holy behavior, through, through a separated life, but we want to anticipate his coming. And that's kind of what you're talking about, creating that, man, we want Jesus to return, right? That's, mm, that's what you're yes. basically saying. Well, all of New Testament eschatology can be summed up in one word, watch. Mm. And this is really crucial because when we're talking about all of the different views, and there, you're in good company in many of them. There are a lot of wonderful people who hold these varying positions. Absolutely. We're seeing through a glass darkly, so we need to approach these with, with an air of humility, understanding there are a lot of questions that are looming out there. And so when we look at all of the positions, we're looking at, which one is going to answer these questions more sufficiently? And I think for a long time, post-tribulationists, uh, mid-tribulationists, pre-wrath, have had the luxury of hurling questions and accusations at the pre-trib, but they never had to actually answer uh, the many varied and deep theological problems that, yes. that their position actually holds. Um, so, and I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting now your question, oh. now that I'm diving into this. <laughs> Anticipating uh, the return of the Lord. You know where? Yeah. The, uh, so, so, Peter. So when... So we have to anchor ourselves. That's where yeah. I was going with this. And what yeah. we know, there's a lot of what we don't know. So we have to anchor ourselves in what we know and interpret what we're unsure about with what we know. So when we look at New Testament eschatology, there's one thing we know, that the coming of the Lord is supposed to cause us to watch, to anticipate, yes. and to look for him at any moment. It's yes. called imminence. And any eschatological position that robs you of that, no matter how interesting or fanciful it may be, That's right. no matter how many scriptures they may be able to pull up along their side, if it eliminates that anchor, that mm. foundation, then it cannot be one that we should hold to. And there's only one position that allows for that anticipation, and that is the pre-tribulational rapture. That's sure, so there strong. are many questions, and we'll do our best to answer. I think we can yeah. answer all, if not most of those questions. Uh, but that's the key. Which one of the positions allows you to anticipate and to watch? To watch. The other positions do on. Boy, I like that. I like that watch. There's a prophetic word in that when you say watch, because yes. that means pre. It means, hey, this is coming, so you better be watching. So that that is strong, Alan. I just think that is a mighty position to be in. You know, you have been anointed to speak to these things. And when I'm considering all that's happening in the world today, um, and, you, and you look at the way things are going, do you believe that the world's going to get better and better and better? And then finally, the Lord's just going to make his appearing and kind of fix everything finally. Do you believe that? It's hard to look at scripture and come away with that interpretation. It, uh, it would be impossible. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that in the last days, men will become lovers of themselves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy, <laughs> without natural affection. It goes on and on and on, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. It talks about giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, that there's going to be a, a, a great apostasy that takes place. We can certainly talk about that. And that the Antichrist is going to deceive many. And so, and that Jesus comes back, all of the Old Testament speaks of this conquering king who comes back to this mess and then redeems and con yeah. conquers his enemies, redeems his people. And so we're, we're, not, we're not evolving into the coming of the Lord. We're not, that's, we're, we're not good enough to where we're going to build a society that's, that's going so to be good. good enough for Jesus to return. That's not how salvation works. No. That's not how redemption works. We're not Jesus. That's he right. is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is. And he is coming to rescue, to redeem, and to ransom and to destroy his enemies. He's going to rescue, redeem, and ransom his people <laughs> and destroy his enemies in a flash. He and is. that's what we're looking forward to. Alan, I, I love this, man. Sometime you and I got to be in studio together because we could get the whiteboard out. We'd go to town. It would be awesome. Well, <laughs> and it's interesting. You know, they make these fun arguments. Well, you know, life expectancy. 
yeah. or medical advances. The world's getting better and better. Is, is that how God judges whether or not a world is getting better and better? If you want to know how God judges it, you look at the flood. And the Bible says that he looked at humanity and said that their thoughts were evil continually. Yep. Now, it wasn't that their thoughts were evil. It's that there was a, there was a consistency of evil thoughts yes. that were perpetuated continually that caused judgment to have to come. And that's going to be what happens in the last days. So the world may look like it's getting better because of, of uh, life expectancy or medical advancements, but in morality, yeah, it's getting worse and worse. Slavery is worse than it's ever been. Yeah, you Human think trafficking of- is worse than it's ever been. Yeah, you think of the Tower of Babel. I'm sure they thought they were doing pretty good until God came and struck it. You, you go beyond that. You think of Noah and the ark, and during that time, they probably thought things are going pretty good around here. You know, we like this marriage, giving in marriage, all that, and then boom, a cataclysm happens. And then you, you look at all these events that take place all the way up, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm sure the people of Sodom, all those wicked perverts running around in there, they probably thought, boy, things are going really good here. This is just the way we want it, you know, um, yeah. <laughs> our choice. And they're they're going down the road. And then all of a sudden, a big change happened. And I believe that to your point, we're getting to that time in society again, where society may not even see it coming. They say, no, it's fine. And it's certainly maybe in the world's eyes getting better and better and better, a, a wisdom of the world getting better and better. But finally comes the end. And I'll tell you, I just, I'm so on point with what you're saying. Now, Alan, there's, there's more things I want to get into, but you have a new book coming out. And, uh, can you tell us the title of that really quick? Well, let, first of all, I never thought I'd be this guy. Never thought I'd be this guy. Um, but I, I, that's I'm what always I interested. <laughs> when I saw it, I was like, Alan, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm always interested in what the world is talking about. Yeah. And how we can provide a biblical answer, bring people to Jesus Christ through that, and to bring Christians back to the Bible and show them how to give an answer. So I heard Elon Musk give a speech concerning artificial intelligence where he said, with AI, we are summoning the demon. And what he was referring to is, you know, in a movie where some guy is going to draw a pentagram and light candles and summon a demon and he's going to control it. And Elon Musk said, yeah, right. Like he's going to control it. It's going to take over and it's going to, you know, it's going to kill him. He said, I believe with AI, we're doing that. So I began to dig into the subject of AI, which led me into the subject of Nephilim. Interestingly enough, it led me into aliens and extraterrestrials. You're going to find out why here soon. And into the Antichrist. And there are a lot of questions out there, Brother Joseph, about these subjects. So I wrote a book called Summoning the Demon, AI, Aliens, and the Antichrist. How you can give it what's going on in the world today and how you can give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I want to show this this clip here. And it's a promotion for the book. It's like a movie trailer. But please, let's, let's watch this. Let's roll this. If you believe we have crashed craft, as uh, stated earlier, do we have the bodies of the pilots who piloted this craft? As I've stated publicly already in my News Nation interview, uh, biologics came with some of these recoveries. Yeah. Were they, I guess, human or non human biologics? He asked me point blank, Have you read your Bible lately? And I said, Well, sir, I think I know what it says. And he said, Well, then you would know that these things are, are demonic. It turns out that actually, yes, these things have been shot down and crashed, and the U.S. government has the wreckage. There's just no question that some of the reports seem to tell of the sort of thing that you find in poltergeist phenomena. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. Man, Alan. I got to tell you, um, I've read your book. Um, I've had the privilege of reading it in advance. And, and endorsing it, thank you. Uh, well, my, my great privilege, my friend. But I got to tell you, that book is good. You did your homework. It's strong. And this, uh, the trailer kind of is a teaser. But I'll tell you what, it lives up to this trailer. So I encourage you guys to get it. So when is it coming out? When's your book coming out? It's available now on Amazon. But if you want to get a special deal, you can go to EncounterToday.com or... Blame it on the Nephilim.com. Blame it on the Nephilim.com. <laughs> Blame it get, on the Nephilim.com. <laughs> that's right. Blame I it on the it. Nephilim.com. And you'll get half price if you go through there and you get it through us or encountertoday.com. 
And um, we, I, I really dove into the research into this and went into classified, formerly classified documents, it's pulled good. out a lot of documents that are in the book. You actually see Project Blue Book documents and others verifying a lot of what's happening. I have congressional testimony in the book about um, uh, non-human origin oh, man. craft. It's oh. it it's really interesting. I go into Skinwalker Ranch, a oh, popular man. television show. So the good. truth behind that, Project Blue Beam, Project Blue Book, and a whole host of other things, uh, giving a Christian response. Well, I, I got to tell you, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I kept thinking, it, you know, you read some books, and I was going through it, and every page, I thought this is so packed with data. Like everything I read was informative. I kept saying to myself, I didn't know that. That's amazing. So I just encourage people to, to check it out. Uh, the website's available here. I encourage you to do that. And I just love uh, supporting uh, my friends. And Alan DiDio is my friend, and I just really enjoy what he brings out. So thank you for that. Alan, what are some of the things you have, have going right now? What are you working on? What's the, some of the next things you're doing? Well, apart from Summoning the demon, which is which is consuming a lot of our time. We've been surprised by the interest in this book. So thrilled by it and excited by it. Yeah. Again, never thought I'd be the alien guy. Um, <laughs> and um, but we we dive into those subjects, and I promise you, we take you back to the word. Oh, in yes. addition to that, uh, we're we're really trying to increase our presence on media. Yeah. And as as you are, and I want to tell your audience this: we have got to band together this year. We have to. We have got to stand together and support one another. That's why to. I'm encouraging you to watch every single Joseph Z video. Wow. Get that watch time in, like, comment, engage, because it's helping it getting out in front of and more people. The Lord's doing a lot in and through us, and we're yes. so thankful for you and for your support, always standing with us. And you have Encounter Today Church. That's the, right. You, you do Encounter Today. So if people don't know, yeah, Alan the Encounter is Encounter Charlotte. Yeah, Encounter if you Charlotte. Want to come to Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Yep. If you're in that area, just so you know, Alan is a pastor. And whether you know this or don't know this, everybody, you want to connect with that. Great. So I, I always see comments. People are like, did you see Bishop DeDio's teaching today? And so it's, it's just powerful. <laughs> so uh, there's it's just a great buzz out there about what you're doing. And I'll tell you, I've been impacted by your ministry and I've been impacted by the information you bring out. And so I'm so grateful to you for that. So the, the bottom line is this, is we are in the last of the last days. We're getting close to the end. Um, like you said, it's imminence. We got to look at that. And the key word is watch. That really mm. is the prophetic now word, watch. And we need to eagerly desire the coming of the Lord, return. We need to be looking for his return. And I believe that does, to your point, certainly earlier in this broadcast, it does point to a pre-tribulation position. And I just believe that that is why First Thessalonians says to comfort one another with these words, that we are looking for these things that we're going to be caught up in there. So one more button issue I'd like to get into just very briefly here is the rapture itself. People say the rapture is not going to happen or they don't believe in the rapture. They think where it's going to happen is the big argument. But the rapture really is in the Bible. Your, your comments, Ellen. Yeah, absolutely. It's you can tell when someone's been propagandized because they'll say something the rat like the rapture's not in the Bible. Right. Every single person who understands the Bible and understands eschatology believes in the rapture. The rapture is the redemption of our bodies. When there's coming a day soon and very soon when we will be redeemed and our bodies will be revitalized, glorified, however you want to put it, and we will receive the fullness of the redemption that Christ provided on the cross and through his resurrection. The question is concerning the timing of that. Some yes. believe it happens post-tribulationally, mid, biblically, it's pre. And, and so when someone says that, you can tell that they haven't propagandized. But here's what's so key about this. This is the culmination of the entire redemptive work of Christ. So where is it on the divine timeline? I, I can't wait until we can do a whiteboard on this. And oh, we're going to go. All the events <laughs> that have to happen, all of the events that have to happen, uh, and where does the rapture fit in? If you don't place the rapture pre-tribulationally, then you cross out the judgment of the sheep and the goats. You cross out the possibility of a population living here on the earth during the millennial reign of Christ. You eliminate that and you create this eternal insecurity that we can dive into in some other sessions. That, that is would be a fun impossible to break. Yep. It's, 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 it's the theological problems that come with the post-tribulational view are endless and actually, many of which are salvific, and we need to be concerned about those things. But the rapture is the culmination of the redemptive work of Christ. And that could happen at any moment when we who are alive and remain will be called up. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain are called up 
to meet the Lord in the clouds. Yes. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Jesus made this promise in John chapter 14. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. Come on. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. So. Ira Stanville in the old hymn said it best. I've got a mansion just over the hillside in that great land where I'll never grow old. And someday yonder, I'll never more wander and walk on streets that are paved in gold. There's only one view that allows for this to take place, and that is the pre-tribulational rapture of the church, for Jesus to fulfill his promise to take you up to be with him in heaven mm. to the Father's house, and it's wow. coming at any moment. At any moment. Could happen right now. Man. Alan, sir, if you would, would you stretch your hands out and pray for the audience today? Everybody is watching. You know, they're hearing a lot of things, and some of this, we might be getting a lot of amens here. Some people might be going, oh, I don't know if I agree with that. It's not, you know, we're not trying to just make a fight, but we're trying to really say what we believe the Bible says. And, you know, mm -hmm. truth will set you free. When you believe it and know it, the truth begins to liberate you. And that's why we're talking about these things. Sir, would you please stretch out your hand and pray for those that are watching right now? I pray right now in the name of Jesus for a healthy anticipation yes, of Lord. the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to rise in your heart. We call it hope. Let hope arise in your heart, yes, a hope that blesses you yes. and everything you put your hand to, it will prosper because you always have one eye on the prize, which is the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. I pray that there be an anticipation that rises in your heart that will overcome the deceptions of the enemy. And I pray that this hope will overcome all of the struggles that you face right now, knowing yes. that at any moment you're going to meet your Savior in heaven. We receive that now in Jesus' name, and I pray you put on the helmet of salvation to stand against the wiles of the enemy. I pray that you become the restraining order in this mm. earth, pushing yes. back the darkness, Come holding on. back the Antichrist, and preaching the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Come on. In Jesus' name, mm. amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please check out EncounterToday.com. Uh, my friend, Alan DiDio, I encourage you to repost this, share this everywhere you can. Remember this, on a bad day, you're anointed to be the best there is. And a man or woman with a revelation is not at the mercy of a culture gone mad. Bishop Alan DiDio, thank you so much, my friend, for being with me today. I just appreciate you and your family. Always an honor, man. Thank you and to your audience who stand with you and support this amazing ministry. Thank you for all you do. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, God bless y'all. And if you would, please check this next part out. Watch this. In a last day's culture, and you've got to understand something. Both God and the kingdom of darkness are territorial, and you are the hinge pin. You are absolutely the emissary, the free moral agent of permission to give access to light or darkness. I'm Joseph Zeeb, and I recently had the Spirit of the Lord speak to me to write this book, Servants of Fire, it is a last day's prayer, intercession, and prophecy manual for how to rise up, activate the forces of heaven to work on your behalf. We go into so many things in this book that I know God spoke to me about from his word that's going to greatly impact you and take you forward. The world is crazy. Things are getting wild, but you can overcome with the spiritual forces of heaven right from the manual that's written in this book. We go into everything from dealing with strange encounters, wicked spirits, how to push back authorities that are of dominion of evil and take territory in Jesus. I gotta tell you, this book is a must have for your library, a must have. It will navigate you right through these difficult days and you will see victory, you will see results. Did you know most Christians, most believers have everything they need all they need is a revelation of what they have. And this book will provide that for you. You need it. I'm telling you, it's a now word, a revelation. I'm Joseph Z. I hope you pick up Servants of Fire for your future and your benefit today.